We're now very lucky to have Patrick Harris, the leader of the Merino study, which, as we heard, is doing so wonderfully well internationally. He's coming to speak to us about supermobile superbugs. Patrick's a microbiologist here at uh, Pathology Queensland. He's also doing his PhD at, with the University of Queensland under David Patterson. Thanks, Jason. It's been great to be here to talk to you, and I'm glad there's still a few people left here. Um, hopefully, I can uh, keep you awake for the next 10, 15 minutes. I was given this quite sexy title of Supermobile Superbugs, uh, which is nice and enigmatic, and I thought what I'd talk about is, um, I guess, really trying to put the problem of antibiotic resistance into a more global, international context, and really think about uh, some of the impacts that human travel can have and, and creating this global uh, phenomenon of antibiotic resistance that we're trying to battle against. I think it's probably worth starting with something that we all know, but it's worth, can't really be overstated, is that we live in a really unprecedented age in, in human history whereby there's probably uh, at no other time in human history has, has there been such a, a amount of human mobility across the planet. So it's estimated that more than 2 billion people are traveling internationally every year, uh, and uh, they're traveling obviously further and more frequently. Um, and it's somebody estimated that about 300 million people will be traveling to or through an area that is highly endemic for antibiotic resistance. So one can see how very easily uh, a person acquiring an antibiotic-resistant um, organism or an antibiotic-resistance gene in one country can so very quickly transmit this and carry it back to their home country. And obviously much of this is driven by uh, in, uh, the ease of air travel and the availability of cheap flights across the world. Approximately one and a half billion people will be traveling uh, as an international air passenger in the next, uh, in, just in this year alone. Interestingly, quite a, a large proportion of this, over a third, will be within the Asia-Pacific region. And this is one of the uh, areas uh, in the world which is thought to, uh, in, the, in the next few decades, really uh, rapidly expand in terms of access to air travel, primarily from the rise of the middle class in, in emerging economies in China and so on. And with that comes uh, a greater demand for travel and tourism and leisure time. And just in this year alone, in the first three months, over uh, 340 million tourists travelled uh, uh, by a flight uh, at, some, at some point. And this, again, is an, a figure that's been increasing exponentially every year. So clearly, um, there are huge numbers of people travelling across the world. Much of this is driven by you know, advances in, in, in the economy, which is potentially a positive thing. But there's also, obviously, some... Uh, severe human disasters occurring in the world at this point in time. And we also know that there are millions of people who are displaced from their homeland through war, poverty, conflict, uh, natural disasters, and so on. This was a nice figure I came across. If you redraw a map of the world, not by geographical size, but by, uh, in this case, uh, the numbers of people either leaving a country due to displacement or arriving as a refugee, you can see the huge predominance of um, conflict zones such as Syria here or Afghanistan, Somalia. And uh, what's striking is that most people are traveling to their neighboring countries. So you can see here that from Syria, the, the, most people are traveling to Turkey or Europe, uh, or other parts of the Middle East or in Africa to neighboring countries. I might note that despite the hysterical headlines, we often come across Australia is still tiny there in the corner. So there's obviously an, a real enormous human disaster occurring in many senses whereby patient, uh, people are being displaced from their normal environments. And one can imagine that in war-torn areas, health of, one of the first things to go is normal health care provision, sanitation, and so on. So it's a perfect in environment for the breakdown in sort of uh, normal health care provision and a, 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 a recipe for the breeding of antibiotic resistance. So why are gram... I mean, I have an interest in gram negatives. Um, uh, and why are gram negatives interesting? Well, they, they, they have an enormous array of uh, genes and mechanisms at their disposal to fight antibiotics that we throw at them. Uh, and this can be by a variety of methods. They can break down antibiotics by enzymatic uh, uh, destruction, uh, often carried on mobile genetic elements such as plasmids. They can pump out the antibiotics. They can prevent influx uh, it would, to, to the antibiotics client actually get into the cell and so on. And all of this obviously is mediated by acquisition of uh, genetic elements that can mediate these mechanisms. 
And primarily, one of the interesting things about the bacterial genome is that there's an awful lot of horizontal gene transfer. So it's estimated that about 25% of the bacterial genome is actually acquired, uh, not just inherited in the normal way, but actually acquired laterally from other uh, species within the environment. And this allows phenomenal diversity and rapid evolutionary adaptation to environmental exposure, such as throwing antibiotics at them. If one considers, for instance, E. coli, even though a single E. coli cell may only have a few thousand genes within it, if you think of the entire pan genome of E. coli, there may be several tens of thousands of genes available to the E. coli to use should it be necessary under environmental stress. So this allows um, really uh, the, the organism to adapt very quickly to whatever we may throw at it. I like this quote from some Australian microbiologists who work on mobile genetic elements. Uh, Lateral gene transfer potentially makes all genes in the microbial biosphere a single common and shared resource. So you don't need to just think about a single organism. You need to think about the entire um, microbiosphere. Now, one of the key uh, genetic structures that mediate antibiotic resistance, that particularly when one considers things like ESBL or carbapenemase um, genes, uh, are these things called plasmids. So these are small genetic structures that are outside the, the normal chromosome. Uh, they often carry multiple resistance determinants at the same time. So you may have your carbapenemase gene, but also a gene to an aminoglycoside resistance, quinolone resistance, and so on. And these can travel together. And what's important about these is that, they, that the, these organisms can have a primitive form of sex where they can share this genetic information, and that, uh, that can be rapidly tr- transferred horizontally across the bacterial po- population. And not only can it travel across different strains, so one type of E. coli can send it to another E. coli. It can go from an E. coli to a serratia, to a pseudomonas, etc. And if you have a mixture of organisms, particularly as you see in the human gastrointestinal tract, there can be incredible genetic crosstalk between these different strains and these different species. A good example of this is an ESBL that is becoming a huge problem across the world called CTXM. This stands for kefataximase Munich. So it's an ESBL that has a preference for hydrolyzing kefataxime over keftazidime, and it happened to have first been described in Munich. So in the late uh, 1980s, Uh, I think it was a child who had otitis media in Munich uh, where they first described this. But actually, at the same time, some researchers also in South America described uh, exactly the same phenomenon. It was later found that this was actually a chromosomal beetle lactamase that had been mobilized from a less common environmental gram negative called Cluvera, was mobilized onto a plasmid, and then spread easily into things like E. coli, Klebsiella, and all our common uh, gram negative pathogens that we know and love. What's interesting is that having been described only in the late 80s, by the 1990s, this was described simultaneously all over the world in multiple different countries and multiple different circumstances. So either there's been uh, multiple acquisitions into it, onto these plasmids and into our intrabacteriaceae or rapid dissemination across the world. We think it's probably an element of both. So from the genetics, this seems to have been introduced about seven or eight times in, into the bacterial population. But also there has been a strong association with the CTXM type genes with highly successful epidemic clones, particularly the ST131 uropathogenic E. coli, which is a highly successful uh, sort of human adapted organism that has spread all over the world. So you've got this complex interplay between these genes that are jumping from from different circumstances and finding themselves into, into organisms that are very capable of spreading in the human population. And now we find that CTXM actually is the dominant ESBL across the world. And there are numerous different lineages and different types of CTXM now described, uh, but they tend to displace the the more traditional TEM or SHV type uh, ESBLs that we used to be familiar with, particularly in hospital or nosocomial outbreaks. Um, But now this is the the dominant ESBL in E. coli and is found uh, very much in the community as well as in hospital infections. And certainly in the Merino trial that David talked about earlier, we've been randomizing patients who have bloodstream infections caused by third-generation cephalosporin-resistant uh, 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 E. coli Klebsiella's. And we've been retrieving a lot of these uh, isolates back in our lab here. And we found the absolute predominance of uh, uh, CTXM-type ESBLs. In fact, 
It's, we are struggling to find anything apart from e, uh, CTXM. The, the second most common type of uh, beta lactamase we're coming across actually are plasmid AMPCs, which is a whole different story that is probably underestimated. And even the main three types that we see, the CTXM15, 27, and 14, they all belong to the CTXM9 lineage. So clearly this is our, our dominant phenomenon in this part of the world, for, at least for bloodstream infections. And the, and the other part of the story is that this is very much driven by this epidemic clone of E. coli called ST131. So we sequence typed all the first 100 or so isolates that we got, and you can see that it's absolutely dominated by the ST131, and all the other sequence types are relatively uncommon. And I think this is very much part of the story of why we're seeing such uh, extraordinary rates of resistance across the world. So this is a meta-analysis that Hosam and I did last year. We looked at all the studies reporting prevalence in urinary tract infections, so urinary intrabacteriaceae, to third-generation cephalosporins. And as you can see, there's really absolutely <laughs> unbelievable rates of resistance in some parts of our neighboring countries in the Asia-Pacific, but also in the Middle East and, and, and uh, Mediterranean countries. It's a very sobering thought to think that if you have a UTI in India or China, there may be about a 30% chance that that will be an ESBL carrier. And much of that, again, is within the community now. And again, much of this is driven by the dissemination of this CTXM enzyme. And this, this is relevant for Australia? Well, yes, very much so. And a, a tangible example of this is uh, something that we see in the clinic on a regular basis is people who have traveled overseas, particularly older men, they come home, they get their prostate checked, their PSA is elevated. We now know there are hundreds of thousands of men now having this, this type of procedure where a needle is inserted through the rectum under ultrasound guidance into the prostate. Now, historically, it's been a relatively safe procedure. If you give antibiotics such as quinolones prior to the procedure, there's usually a very low risk of complications and infection. But if you can imagine, if you've traveled to one of these countries where there's a very high, again, you know, here up to almost 70 or 80% resistance to fluoroquinolones and some of their E. coli's, uh, you, if you're then pre-enriching that with exposing them to ciprofloxacin prior to the procedure, when you get your infection, you're almost guaranteed to have something that's going to be much more resistant and usually harder to treat. And these patients can get quite sick quite quickly. So I think taking consideration of a person's travel history is extremely important when you're starting to consider uh, performing these kind of invasive procedures. And I think in many cases you might even consider deferring them or trying another approach or maybe not doing the procedure altogether. There's been some good studies looking at well, what does it mean if you travel overseas? So if I'm an Austra a healthy Australian and I travel to India or China, what's my risk of acquiring an ESBL? And there's been some nice studies that have come from, from Canberra a few years ago where they looked at, I think there were healthy students who were traveling overseas, and they looked at those that acquired in their gastrointestinal tract any organism that was resistant to some of their key antibiotics like quinolones, third-generation cephalosporins, and so on. So although there was a, a, a low baseline rate of resistance to any of these antibiotics, this dramatically increased. So by the time you'd come back from your travel, uh, about 50% of these people were colonized with some kind of resistant organism. And the other interesting thing with this study, they managed to follow them up over a period of six months. And although there was a, a reasonable drop-off in the colonization rate, around 10% or so were still colonized six months after they came back. So you can imagine if somebody in this circumstance let's say had major surgery, was given uh, chemotherapy, had some you know, traumatic disaster, their chance of getting an infection with a multi-resistant organism is going to be high. And there's other studies that have looked at this. This is a more recent study from Finnish uh, travelers. So Finland, again, has a very low rate of antibiotic resistance in the population. And they looked at travelers traveling to some of these high endemic areas. And again, around 20% of these would come back colonized with an ESBL producer in their gut. This increased dramatically if they had diarrhea or if they used antibiotics. And again, I think my favorite figure for this is if you travel to South Asia, you get traveler's diarrhea and you use antibiotics, you have about an 80% chance of being colonized with an ESBL. So... Unfortunately, if you get diarrhea and you go to India, try to avoid taking Cipro or whatever they give you. Um, and similarly, people have looked at uh, the... This is obviously culturing organisms from the gut. 
You also want to be interested in the kind of genes that people are acquiring that may not be necessarily culturable. This is a, a study from the Netherlands where they actually tried to identify which genes people are acquiring in, in their gut resistome. They looked at 122 travelers. This was a, a few years back. I think these were mainly people traveling to, to Asia. Uh, and again, they showed that there was a dramatic increase in the acquisition of this CTXM beta lactamase, but also things like plasmid mediated quinolone resistance genes. Um, the only reassuring thing of this, I guess, is that they didn't find any NDM, but this was a few years back with it. You repeated that now, that may change. And once again, the highest risk part of the world seemed to be uh, Southeast Asia and India. And there have been, again, several sort of smallish studies that have tried to assess the risk of this in healthy travelers, and the, the results are fairly consistent. You know, you, anywhere between sort of 20, 30, even up to 70% of people will become colonized with an ESBL, depending a bit on where you travel to. And again, consistent risk factors seem to be taking antibiotics when you're there, how long you're there, whether you get diarrhea. One study came up with eating ice cream and pastries for some reason. So just to finish off, I think, um, you know, we've talked a bit about plasmid-mediated um, antibiotic resistance. Probably in the last few months uh, and the end of last year, there's been a, a, a real sort of explosion in interest in a totally new phenomenon, which is plasmid-mediated uh, res resistance to colistin, which, as David talked about earlier, is one of our sort of uh, last resort antibiotics for these um, uh, multiply antibiotic-resistant organisms. So this was a Chinese group who have been monitoring E. coli resistance to colistin in animal um, carcasses in China, and they'd noticed over a period of years an increase in colistin resistance, and they were able to identify this totally new gene called MCR1, which is interesting in itself, but they also were able to show that it was on one of these highly mobile plasmids and that it was easily transferable to all kinds of other species, including uh, you know, virulent clones of, of, of Klebsiella or Pseudomonas and so on. So this really woke everybody up to the fact that actually there's potentially a huge disaster brewing in this part of the world. Um, and actually what's interesting is just in the last probably six months there's now over 100 papers published on MCR1 uh, as long as some rather sort of dramatic headlines. I, I rather enjoyed the apocalypse pig head, headline. Um, uh, it's also been found now in the US which obviously caused a, a considerable stir at the time. Uh, I noticed only just a couple of weeks ago people have started identifying in, in things like birds, which is interesting because that ties in with some of the other resistance genes which can be identified in seagulls. And there may be all kinds of vectors and ways these things are being spread that we really underappreciate. And what's interesting now about MCO1, and I guess following on from this sort of travel theme, is that it's actually everywhere. Uh, when you start to look for it, it's almost everywhere in the world you want to think about. And pretty much every day... There's a new paper coming out saying MCR1 found in Uzbekistan, MCR1 found in the North Pole. It'll probably only be the Ant Antarctica or somewhere that doesn't have it. And it's also both in animal samples and also human samples. So again, there's probably a complex story in there somewhere between this interplay between uh, a a animal um, antibody resistance in animals and agricultural uh, products and, and the human population. And again, the Chinese also looked back at some of their stored samples. And what's fascinating is actually MCR, MCR1 has been around since the 80s. And uh, it probably coincides to a certain extent with the routine use of colistin in chicken feed. And it's only really in the last few years when it's become uh, accelerated in the population that it's become clinically apparent. So just to end on a very depressing note, this is something else I came across just to continue the the, uh, the disaster of antibiotic resistance in, uh, or overuse of antibiotics in animals. This is actually a chicken feed supplement uh, that you can buy in India, which is a great combination of two fluoroquinolones and colistin. And apparently this is very widely used in India. And that seems like an absolutely perfect recipe for uh, making sure these things disseminate widely in the animal population, and then you feed it to your, to your humans, which seems like a great idea. So on that positive note... <laughs> I'll probably stop and, I guess, just conclude by saying, I guess I've gone through some reasons why I'm pretty concerned that we're, and I'm not alone, obviously, in worrying about this perfect global storm that allows antibiotic resistance to flourish, uh, obviously driven by the excessive use of antibiotics, which we've talked about a lot today, 
Um, but we also need to consider this incredibly vast and dynamic reservoir resistance genes that exist both in our favorite pathogens, but also in the environment and also in many other organisms that are fairly silent or invisible to us in our gut and elsewhere in the environment. Obviously, a lot of this is being driven by the unprecedented human movement across the world. Um, and in some places, um, this is exacerbated by you know, problems and war and conflict and poverty and so on. Um, and I think one of our biggest problems is that we don't have good ways of monitoring or surveilling this in healthy populations. We really only see the tip of the, pop, tip of the iceberg in our sick patients in hospital, but there's a huge story going on elsewhere that we're probably fairly blind to. So on that very depressing note, I'm going to stop and say thanks to everybody for listening. I wish I'd know. Um, I mean, I think that's part of the problem is, you know, we keep getting surprised by things that we, you know, we don't know about and we're not expecting. Um, I guess you probably just need to think up your worst case scenario and it'll probably happen before too long. Um, you know, I, obviously we're beginning to see plasmids carrying both MCR1 and NDM and all these other things, you know, which is going to be creating a huge problem in itself. Um, I suspect the next big problem will come totally left field. We won't be expecting it, and we probably won't even pick it up until it really becomes a massive problem. And I think that's that's the difficulty. I don't even pretend to have an answer as to what we do about that. And I think part of the problem is, you know, with with MCR1, you know, we only test colistin in our multi-resistant organisms. The problem was this was circulating for ages, probably in fairly boring E. coli, and we wouldn't have bothered looking for it, so we never knew it, it was there. So, you know, I guess you know, the more robust surveillance we can have and, you know, with, with work that John's been doing, you know, really targeting and doing a systematic surveys of these organisms and looking to see what's out there and testing for a full range of antibiotics is probably the only way you're going to start picking this up. But it requires effort and money. Thank you.